In this lecture, we'll derive the mathematical formulas that are used to count the number of permutations, combinations, and partitions of a collection of objects. And we'll present a few examples to show how these formulas are used to determine probabilities. Well, we'll begin our discussion about permutations, combinations, and partitions by looking at the ways in which we can select a subset of objects from a larger collection of objects. To illustrate the basic principles, let's consider this collection of 13 cards, which happens to consist of all the cards from a common deck that are marked with the club symbol. What we'd like to do now is examine all the ways we can select 5 cards from this collection of 13. The first card we select could be any of the 13 original cards, therefore we have 13 ways in which we can select this card. We might, for instance, select the 7 of clubs as our first card. Regardless of which card we select as our first card, we'll now be choosing our second card from the remaining 12 cards. We might, for instance, select the 3 of clubs as our second card. And because we had 13 ways to select our first card, and 12 ways to select our second, the number of ways in which we could select the first two cards is 13 times 12, or 156. We now have 11 choices for our third card. Which might, for instance, be the King of Clubs. And although we are showing only one particular way in which we can select the three cards, that is, the 7 followed by the 3 followed by the King, it is important to realize that there are a total of 13 times 12 times 11, or 1,716 ways in which we might have selected the first three cards. And regardless of the first three cards we select, we'll be left with 10 choices for the fourth card, which might be the Ace of Clubs. Finally, our fifth card will be left with 9 choices. And after we've selected the fifth card, which in this case was the five of clubs, we'll have one particular sequence of five cards that could have been selected from the original 13, that is, the seven followed by the three followed by the king followed by the ace followed by the five. Now there are many other ways this could have happened, and to be precise, the number of ways is 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9, which turns out to be 154,440. Now, for many situations we might encounter, it is convenient to use a shorthand notation for writing the mathematical formula for determining the number of ways to select k objects from n original objects. To see where this formula comes from, let's write 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 in the following way. First, we'll write out 13 times 12 times 11 all the way down to 1, which is known as 13 factorial. And then, because this expression contains some extra terms, we'll divide by all the terms that don't belong. This term in the denominator, 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, is known as 8 factorial. So we can write our result with the more compact notation of 13 factorial divided by 8 factorial. Which, with a little thought, we can see will be equal to n factorial divided by n minus k factorial for a general problem in which we want to determine the number of ways to select k things from a collection of n things. At this point, it's very important to note that the order in which we select the object is important. For instance, our example sequence of 7 followed by 3 followed by the king followed by the ace followed by the 5 is one of the 154,440 possible ways to select 5 objects from 13. Another way might be king followed by 5 followed by ace followed by 3 followed by 7. And in some situations, the order may not matter. And instead, we might be interested in knowing the number of unique ways to select five cards regardless of the order in which we select them. The number of ways we can reorder these five cards is equal to the number of ways to select five things out of five. Based on the formula we just derived, that's equal to 5 factorial divided by 0 factorial. And because 0 factorial is equal to 1, this number is equal to 5 factorial. That is, there are 120 ways to reorder the five cards we selected in our example. And that means we counted these particular five cards 120 times in our original formula. In general, the number of ways to reorder k things is k factorial, 
And because our original formula for the number of ways to select k things from n contained k factorial permutations of the same k things, we can divide by k factorial to determine the number of ways to select k things when the order doesn't matter. In summary, there are two important formulas for permutations and combinations. When order matters, we call the k things a k element permutation from the original n elements. When the ordering doesn't matter, we call the k things a k element combination from the original n elements. Well, let's look at an example. Suppose we toss a coin 10 times and we want to determine the number of ways we can get 7 heads. Let's think about the 10 tosses as 10 different coins, all tossed at the same time. Next, we'll take 7 of them and assign them heads as their outcome. And the remaining 3 we'll call tails. Once we've assigned heads to 7 of the coins, we can reorder them in any way we want. That is, changing the order of the 7 coins won't change the fact that we got 7 heads. Therefore, we use the formula for a combination of 7 things from 10. This is equal to 10 factorial divided by the product of 7 factorial times 3 factorial, or 120. That is, there are 120 ways to get 7 heads for 10 coin tosses. The total number of outcomes is 2 to the 10th, or 1024, so the probability that we see 7 heads for 10 coin tosses if the coins have equal chances for heads and tails, is 120 divided by 1024, or approximately 0 0.12. This formula is so important for problems like this that we often use the special notation shown here, and we call the formula the binomial coefficient. We'll learn more about the importance of this formula when we learn about something called Bernoulli and binomial random variables. To understand the idea of partitions, let's look at an example of putting 20 people into three groups with 10, 6, and 4 people in each group. Here are 20 people all eager to be assigned to groups, each of them having a name with just simply one letter. If we start with the group of 10, then the number of ways we can assign 10 people into this group is equal to the number of ways we can select 10 things from our original group of 20. And because the order in which we pick the people doesn't matter, we'll use the binomial coefficient formula to determine the number of ways. For example, here is one of the 184,756 different ways to assign this group. Next, let's select the six people from the remaining 10. Again, because the order of our selection doesn't matter, we can use this formula to determine the number of ways to select this group after we've selected the group of 10. Here's one of the 210 possible ways we could have done that. We now have four people left to assign to the final group of four people. If we use our formula for selecting four people from a group of four, we should not be surprised that the formula tells us that there's only one way to do that. Again, it's important that we aren't concerned with the ordering of our selection. If we were, then there would be four factorial ways to put these people into the final group. Now the total number of ways that we can put the people into these three groups is determined by multiplying the number of ways we can make a group of 10 from a group of 20 times the number of ways we can make a group of 6 from the remaining group of 10 times the number of ways we can make a group of 4 from that final group of 4. And when we examine these equations, we note that a term in the denominator of the first formula appears in the numerator of the second. Likewise, a term in the denominator of the second appears in the numerator of the third. And after canceling these terms and noting that 0 factorial is equal to 1, we'll be left with the formula for the number of ways we can put 20 people into three groups of 10, 6, and 4 people. If we carry out the math, then we'll see that there are nearly 39 million different ways to assign the 20 people to these three groups. Now let's look at the general result. If the first group has n1 things from the original n, and we aren't concerned with the order within the group, 
then the number of ways we can assign things to the first group is determined by this formula. After assigning the n1 things to the first group, we'll have n minus n1 things available to assign to the second group. And after assigning the first two groups, we'll have n minus n1 minus n2 things available to assign to the third group. We can extend the analysis in this manner all the way to the last group. Then, to determine the number of ways we can assign things to all the groups, we'll need to multiply each of the results for each group. Like our previous example, the first two groups will share a term like this. The second and third groups will share these terms. The third and fourth will share this term. And this process will continue until we're left with a ratio that looks like this. And this ratio can be used for any problem where we want to partition n things into r groups with n1, n2, all the way up to nr things in each group where n1 plus n2 plus nr and all of the terms add up to n. Well, to see how we apply the underlying principles we used for combinations and permutations to other problems, let's look at the probability that we see exactly one ace in the first ten cards dealt from a well-shuffled deck of cards. To begin, let's look at one particular way that we can get exactly one ace in the first ten cards. The first card could be one of the aces. And because there are 4 aces out of 52 cards, the probability of that happening is 4 out of 52. Let's suppose, for instance, that it's the ace of clubs. The next card could be anything but an ace. And there are 48 possibilities out of the 51 remaining cards. Suppose, for instance, that the next card is the nine of spades. The next card after that could be anything other than an ace or the second card, which was the nine of spades for our example. And for that, there are now 47 possibilities out of the 50 remaining cards. If we continue with this process, we can determine the appropriate probabilities to associated with each of the remaining card positions. Then if we multiply all of these probabilities, we can determine the probability for seeing an ace in the first position and some card other than an ace in all of the other positions. And that will turn out to be approximately 0 0.0424. Now that, however, is the probability that we see an ace in the first position and something other than an ace in all of the other positions. But we could have seen an ace in the second position, which would have the same probability or in the third position, which again would have the same probability, or in any of the ten possible positions. And all of these different situations would have the same probability of 0 0.0424. This means that the probability that we see exactly one ace in one of the first ten cards is equal to ten times the probability that we see one ace in a particular position, such as the first position, because that's the number of ways we can see one ace times the probability of seeing one ace in a particular position. And since the ace can wind up in any of the ten positions, we'll have ten times that probability that we had computed earlier. And that results in an overall probability of roughly 0 0.424, or about a 42% chance. Well, now for another example, let's look at the probability that we see exactly two aces and one king in the first ten cards from a well-shuffled deck. As with the previous example, we could first evaluate the probability of seeing the two aces followed by a king followed by seven cards that are neither aces nor kings. Because there are four aces to begin with, the probability for the first ace is 4 divided by 52. Then there will be three aces left in the remaining 51 cards, so the probability that the second card is an ace, after the first card was, is 3 divided by 51. And because there are still four kings in the remaining 50 cards, the probability that the next card is a king is equal to 4 divided by 50. Then the 49 remaining cards will contain 44 cards that are neither aces nor kings, so the probability that the next card is not an ace or a king is equal to 44 divided by 49. 
Finally, we can continue this analysis for all the cards and then multiply all of the probabilities together to determine the probability that we see an ace, followed by an ace, followed by a king, followed by seven cards that are neither aces nor kings. The number of ways we can order the two aces and king within the first three cards is the binomial coefficient for three choose one, which is equal to three. That is, the king could be the last of the three cards, as I've shown here, or the second of the three cards, or the first of the three cards. So regardless of where we place these three cards, there will always be three ways to do it. We could, for instance, put these cards in the third, seventh, and tenth positions, again with three possible orders for in those, within those positions. That is, we could order them king, ace, ace, as shown here, or ace, king, ace, as shown here, or ace, ace, king, as shown here. Now the number of ways we can arrange these three cards within the 10 cards is the binomial coefficient for 10 choose 3, which is equal to 120. Therefore, the probability of seeing exactly two aces and one king in 10 cards is the number of orderings for the three cards within the 10, multiplied by the number of orderings of the one king within the three cards, multiplied by the probability of seeing two aces and one king in any of the positions. And the resulting probability is roughly equal to 0 0.0581.